everybody. Amen. The Lord, everybody. Truly, this is the day that the Lord has made, and we should rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Truly, the Lord has been good to us. Amen. And we certainly want to give him praise and thanksgiving for all that he has done for us, all that he is doing, and all that he will do in the life of the believer. Praise the Lord, giving them praise for this day, this day that he has loaded us with benefits so that we will not go lacking in anything. Praise the Lord. So as we make ready to get started uh, with our Sunday morning pastoral teaching, we certainly want to go before the Lord in prayer. Father, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, Lord God, we love you. We appreciate you, Lord God. We give you praise. We give you thanks again for who you are and who you are in our lives. We thank you for all that you have done for us, all that you are doing, all that you will do in the life of your people. I pray that you bless this day, Lord God. Bless your people that are going and coming, oh Lord God. Take them to your house of prayer safely without incident or accident, hurt, harm. Other things, Lord God. And I pray that you open up our hearts, our minds, and our understanding that we may receive your word and receive it with gladness. And having received it, that we act upon it to do all that you have commanded of us, so that everything that we both say and do will glorify you in every way. In these are many blessings we pray in your precious name. Amen and amen. amen. Glory to God. Amen. Again, uh, we're still in the book of 1 Corinthians. For those of you who are watching this telecast, praise the Lord. We're going to continue, amen, my way of review of those things that we covered on last week. And then from there, move forward into our study. We're still in chapter 7 under the heading of questions about marriage. Questions about marriage. And on last week, we was under the subheading of Christian calling does not change the position in life. In other words, when we are called, when we become saved and give our lives to Christ, it does not immediate, immediately change our position in life. And so we started with verse 21 on last week, verse 21, and so we will pick up here for our review. So based on verse 21, uh, Paul lets us to know that being a slave would not hinder uh, you from being a Christian. Absolutely not. But if you can become free, then prefer freedom to slavery and use your freedom then to serve Christ. So then we also learn that a slave could be freed by the consent or the consent of his master by purchasing his own freedom or by someone else paying for his freedom. So in some ages, masters thought that by freeing a slave, one would gain merit for his own soul salvation. In other words, uh, I'm a slave owner, but I'm saved now, and I don't believe that anyone should be a slave, so I'm going to set you free in hope. <laughs> that it would gain me something in eternal life. No, well, no, Bishop. Yeah. If they're doing it because they hope it'll give them something and not doing it just because they know it's right, it won't help them, correct? But if they're doing it because they get saved and so they realize that it's wrong for them to hold somebody else in bondage so they let them free, Mm -hmm. then that would actually work to their favor. But if they're doing it, like we say, don't give out of necessity. Mm -hmm. If they're doing it to gain favor, then they're doing it for the wrong reason. For the wrong reason. Yeah, one heart, 
one heart must be right when they are doing things. And you're absolutely right. One heart must be right. Otherwise, it virtually gains you nothing. It virtually gains you nothing. So that's definitely something uh, to take in consideration and to remember. Uh, whatever you do, do it wholeheartedly else unto the Lord and not ourselves. And so then, uh, he goes on to let us know uh, if you do become free from slavery, then you should never sell yourself again else the slave of men. And some were doing that, but don't do it again because now you are totally free to serve the Lord. And then from there we looked at advice concerning virgins and unmarried men, or just virgin in total. So verse 25 and verse 26, Paul's advice here, okay, it was for the present distress of persecution of the Christian. They were at the mercy of their enemies with no state protection as we have today. And so on this account, Paul gives the advice that it would be better for unmarried person to remain single. Again, considering the present day stress that they were confronted with. Okay, and then as we move down, uh, he shifts to advice to married Christians. Married Christians in verse 29. We learn that history teaches us that this predicts the immediate persecution of the Christian with Emperor Nero was then preparing against the Church of Christ. And I share some history with you concerning Emperor Nero persecution of the Christian in 64 A.D. And then, of course, from there, after verse 31, he switched to uh, the theme where he contrasts responsibilities of the married and the unmarried. So in verse 32, basically tells us that the single man or woman can attend to the things of the Lord without Distraction. The single man and the single woman can attend to the things of the Lord without distraction. And also, verse 33, uh, he lets us know that the married man or woman has many, many responsibilities in caring for the family. Now, again, he's saying all of this and giving us this advice because of the present day distress that they were faced with. In other words, the less you have to be concerned about, the more you can focus on the things of the Lord. Praise God. So, also then he shift up to verse 35, begin to talk about and give advice to parents concerning virgins of marriageable age, virgins who are now have reached the age where they can be married. So again, in, in verse 36, we learn that in the early times among Jews and Christians, the daughters were woolly in the power of who? Father. The father, yes, yeah, so that he might give them in marriage or perhaps bind them to perpetual virginity. So if the father had devoted his daughter to perpetual virginity and afterwards found that she had her affection centered upon a man being strongly inclined to marry, then he could change his plans regarding her virginity and give her in marriage at any time, even after the flower of her age. And by doing so, he would not be committing sin by changing his plans for her because it was within his power to do so. 
Okay? And that brings us to where we are yeah. today, beginning at verse 37. Yes, sir. So, would it be a sin for the father, because I know it's his right for, to keep the daughter as a virgin and not give her away in marriage, but if he was doing it out of malice or to gain somebody to do chores at the, at the house, you know, so basically he want if because if he didn't give the daughter away, the daughter would still be under his roof. So he could have her cooking, cleaning, doing all these things each and every day for the rest of her life, basically. Mm -hmm. Would that be sin for him for doing it for those kind of selfish reasons? Or was it still his prerogative of the father to say, she's not gonna marry and that's the end of the story? Yeah, well that was his prerogative, that was his responsibility. I would only hope that he would uh, not allow her to marry just to maintain her labor within the home because then he would have to give an account for that as well. Keeping in mind that we will all give an account for the deeds that are done in our body. But if everything is normal and nothing is different and he decided to hold her in that situation, then that was his legal right to do so. It's legal right to do so. And then Paul is going to talk more about that as we move on uh, in this lesson and give some more great advice. We should reflect back on that. So again, we are in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 7, uh, picking up at verse 37. And he says that nevertheless, he that standeth steadfast in his heart, Okay, he's standing steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but has power or control over his own will, and has so decreed in his heart that he would keep his virgin. Paul said he does what? Well. He do as well. He, he do as well. If, he, if, if he's standing steadfast in his heart, and he's not being forced. There's no necessity. He's not under duress. And he yet has control over his own will. Okay? And has so decreed in his heart that he would keep the virgin do his will. In other words, if the father finds it unnecessary to change his plans, okay, it being unnecessary, okay, to be brought his virgin daughter because of her being inclined not to marry and wanting to consecrate both body and spirit, as we saw in verse 34, then let him keep his daughter from marriage. Let him keep his daughter from marriage. Okay? Verse 38 says, So then he that giveth her in marriage doeth well. Right? If I give my daughter in marriage, I'm doing good. But he also said, but he that giveth her not in marriage doeth what? Better. <laughs> and again, this is vice because of their present situation. And I agree with Paul that this makes sense because of what they're faced with. Okay? So if you don't give her to marriage, if you give her in marriage, you do it well, but if you don't, then you do it even better. So what this does actually explain verses 36 and 37 and prove that it is a father who gives or does not give his virgin daughter in marriage. Okay? One does well, and the other one does better. <laughs> so that was... Uh, two sides uh, to that coin. How we doing? Good. And so now he's going to switch and give advice to Christian widows, because you have them too. Paul ain't missing nobody. He's going to now give advice to the Christian widow, whether male or female. So verse 39 says, the wife is bound by the law. Okay? 
She's bound by the law as long as her husband what? Is lying. Is living. So she's bound by the law except for what? Except his death. Those liberating things that we have already discussed. Those things that we discussed already. Okay? So she's bound by the law except for those things that we have discussed that liberates the marriage as long as her husband lives. Okay? He doing what he should do, she doing what she should do. But if her husband be dead, then she is what? She's at liberty to marry whom she will, but what did it say? But only in the Lord. Only in the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, what you talking about, Paul? So again, this appears to be another question that is asked by the church concerning a widow whose husband was dead. Paul gave the Christian law on this and he laid down a restriction that she remarry only who? Another Christian. A Christian man, absolutely. And not a heathen. You see it right there? It's plain as day right there. You got to marry another Christian man and not a heathen. In other words, don't get unequally yoked. Because it ain't going to do nothing but cause you problems. So, he writes this, and we see it. a Christian man and not a heathen. Verse 4 it says, but she is happier, happier if she so abide. If she so abide, what? What, what is he saying here? Stay she, single. That's right, if she stays single. He said, after my judgment, after my opinion, okay, she's going to be happier. And I think also that I have the Spirit of God. Paul said, I, I believe I got the authority to say this. Mm -hmm. You see, because I am an apostle. So now he gives the advice that she would be happier if she remained single in view of what? What was happening. Hmm? What was going on in the what world. What was going on, yeah. Present condition in the world for Christians. So Paul by no means, now understand this, Paul by no means contends for celibacy. He ain't preaching celibacy. He's not contending for that. Okay, but he gave sound advice for the present distress. Okay, because Paul knew that all persons were not like him. <laughs> He had the gift. So he's not, again, contending for celibacy. That's not what he's uh, preaching here. Praise the Lord. So that concludes chapter 7. Any important comment before we move into chapter 8? Totally different subject. Uh, just a lot easier to run if you only got to think about yourself not stepping in a hole. <laughs> I know that's right. It's a whole lot easier. Oh, lot easier. Be focused on yourself and on the things of God when you are not bound by other things, particularly <clears throat> when you are put to flight. And that's what persecution means. It means to put to flight. And what was going on then was certainly make one run. All right. So that's the answers to the questions about marriage. And I think Paul covered it all. He did. He covered it all. He didn't miss nobody or anything. Okay, so we're moving to chapter 8. Under the heading of set free but how free. <laughs> we have been made free. We have been set free but how free are we? Christian liberty. The effects of knowledge and love. The effects of knowledge and love. There is a difference. All right. So Paul begins verse 1 by saying, Now is touching things offered unto idols. 
we know that we all have knowledge. Paul said, we know that we all have knowledge, but when knowledge dug, it puffs up. Knowledge puff it up. But charity edifies. Love builds up where knowledge can tear down. Okay? And so we see the next question that is being asked about here is about idolatry. Okay? They asking Paul concerning idolatry. Okay? So the idea here is that we who are converted to Christianity, both Jews and Gentiles now, have sufficient knowledge concerning idols and idol worship. Whether you were for it or against it, you have knowledge about it. So we also know that we are not bound by Jewish rites and ceremonies. Paul knows this. The Jews were not. There are two things that God left for the church to do. And what is that? Baptism and communion. Baptism and communion. All of that other stuff, Paul let them know we're not bound by all those other rites and ceremonies. But some may carry their knowledge and liberty too far and do that which is not best for the cause of Christ. And some people do that. They, 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 they just go too far and they don't do what is best for the cause of Christ. And so then we learn or know already that the Corinthians, they were puffed up by their knowledge and liberty in Christ. And by doing so, they condemn others. Okay? You know how uh, some folks actually think they know it all, they got it all, but they be condemning others. You see? In their knowledge. So what it did is made, it made them bold. It made them rash. It made them careless regarding the conscience of others who were not so enlightened, you see. And so we have to bear with those who are weak. We don't want to shoot them down, knock them down. Praise the Lord. But we won't love to be involved to build them up because love builds up. It has no quality to puff up or tear down L does not yes and how do you deal with the person who's been a Christian for a long time but they're still on milk and no matter how much you try to uplift and edify them they don't want to put in any work in order to grow mm -hmm. I mean that's, that's going to be on them now that's going to be on them if they refuse to grow. You have done everything that you can. You put them in the classes that they should be in, or you're taking your time to really explain and what have you. If they don't show their interest to grow, then their growth is going to be studied, and that's just the way they're going to live. You see, but we don't have to degrade them or beat them up about it. You see, we just continue in the vein that we're going with the teaching and what have you, and the example in our life. But yeah, they're always going to be babies. I don't care if they're 80 years old. That's it. Oh my gosh, that is so true. <laughs> yeah. And I think yeah. uh, if he can you know, just continue to look, to way, look for ways, if we can continue to look for ways and for tools yeah. to give to them, to help them. But mm -hmm. it's just like going, it's just like in the natural going to school. Not everybody's going to go to college. Right. Not everybody's going to get a trade. Mm -hmm. We have now in our society, <clears throat> I can't remember it being as prevalent when we were going to school, but there are a great number of our kids, uh, they in 12th grade and they can't even read. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. They haven't applied themselves in that. The parents haven't taken the time to make sure that they accomplished that. And so they're they're just gonna they're gonna finish school with some lack. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then Paul talks about this situation as well, as well in other writers and their writing concerning Christians who are still babes. Yes, sir. Yeah, because the part that I have a little bit of trouble with because if you are 
supposed to study to show yourself approved, mm -hmm. and you're to share the gospel. But if you don't put in the effort to study the gospel, then you're not sure of yourself, so you don't share the gospel, and you're not studying to show yourself approved. Aren't, aren't you then committing two separate sins? And if you're doing that after you should have weaned a little bit off the milk, are you truly still saved? I mean, I don't, if you're not, you know, if you're literally called to study to show yourself approved and to share the gospel, mm -hmm. but you won't share the gospel because you know in your heart you don't understand any of the gospel, so you don't want to seem foolish by presenting what you don't know to somebody, mm -hmm. it seems contradictory, or, are you, or can you still be saved because you believe in Jesus Christ, even though you don't take it any step further? Right, and if you don't take it any step further, then you won't have any works. Right. You won't have any works that we learned earlier. Uh, you will be saved, but you won't have any works. You won't have any works at all. And if you do have works that are not of gold and silver, it's going to burn. And so you will be saved, but you just won't have no works. And I don't know what Christian just want to be saved and have no works. Uh, when they get into uh, the kingdom. And some folks just have that disability. Some just don't have the drive. All they want to do is just know that they're saved, that they're in church, that they're praying, and that they're reading the Bible, and they're satisfied with where they are, which we shouldn't be. You see, but once you give your life to Christ and you live saved, okay, then you are saved. Just like the man on the cross, his feet, he didn't get a chance to do no studying, no reading or anything. He just believed God, you see. But I don't know today why anyone would just want to stop there when we shouldn't stop there and we are commanded to study to show ourselves approved well. If we don't, then there won't be any works as a result of that. You follow me? You see? I like to use. I like to use. Um, but when we first met him, he was he was he was, he was at the mission. Mm -hmm. He was recovering from you know his past life yeah. and whether he was a man of the streets and many other things. And we came to Christ because he said to me, he said, "I think I got the Holy Ghost." I said, "Then, if you think you got the Holy Ghost, you need to go back and seek until you get the Holy Ghost, <coughs> and you will know." Mm -hmm. So I didn't pass any judgment on him. So he came and he kept seeking and he did get filled with the Holy Ghost, uh, with the evidence of speaking in tongues. And he began to he began to grow. He came to the classes, the uh, Sunday school classes that you were teaching when we was at COJC. So we just watched him grow over time. It was it was a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. It was really just beautiful to watch him grow from the streets to where he became the deacon. And he could get up and he could expound the word. And he was one that brought many people to Voices of Victory that were on the street with him. I used to follow him some Sunday mornings to pick up people. So he had great works. But we have to make sure that we are careful and uh, not stand in judgment of those who are not progressing like we would love to see them. Mm -hmm. And thank God for God's mercy and his grace. Yeah, because if they get saved, and they're in church, they're going to want to stay in church. And if they stay in church, they're going to hear what it is that they should do and what they shouldn't do. And they'll do that. Whether they grow in their knowledge uh, of the word or not, or try and understand it better than they understand it, if they just hear what to do and what not to do, then they will find themselves uh, adhering uh, to that. But again, the writer, if they stay in church long enough, they're gonna the word gonna hit them. They gonna smack them right up beside the face <laughs> about still being a babe in Christ. So love, then love is uh, can only be constructive uh, because it is of whom God, absolutely. You see, so verse two says, if and if any man. Think that he knoweth anything, 
He knoweth nothing yet else he ought to know. <laughs> so, in other words, the person who act, acts in a rash, proud way knows nothing else he ought to know, Paul is saying. So, if he torments his brother's weak and tender conscience with his food and conduct, he does not love God or his brother as he should. Okay, let's look at Matthew 22, 36 through 40. Matthew chapter 22, verse 36 through 40. Paul is going to deal with the conscience by way of food here. In a moment, he said, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? So they asked him, Jesus. And Jesus said unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. For they said, This is the first and the great commandment. This is the first and the great. You ain't going to beat this. Uh, and the second is like unto it, that thou shalt love thy neighbor, how? As thou self. Thou self. And verse 4 says, on these two commandments alone hang all the law and the prophets, because charity suffered long. Okay? So then, again, I said, if he torments his brothers, weak and tender conscience with his food and conduct. He does not love God or his brother else he should. So in verse 3 Paul said, but if any man love God, the same is what? Known, Known of him. What do you mean Paul? Well you are recognized as worthy of his intimacy and his love and you are owned by him. <laughs> you are owned by him and not the devil. Even though we are his creation, but you have given yourself over to the devil because he that loveth not, knoweth my God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God. Why? God is love. Because God is love. Yes, sir. Yeah, it, and. <laughs> What always comes to mind when I hear that passage mm -hmm. is Toy Story, how all the toys were always looking to make sure they had DeMarco Andy on their, on them somewhere. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> he, was, he was a little kid who had them, and they were so happy when they saw Andy's name still on them. <laughs> and the name still on it. Yep. Praise God. So then, now, you're going to deal with the conscience and food. So verse 4 says, else concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols. Okay? We know that an idol is what? Nothing. Nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but what? One. But one. Somebody get for me, do the run the six and four. Get Deuteronomy 6 and 4. We should all know this one by heart. Again, Paul is right in present tense, but he's always quoting from the law of the Old Testament. He says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Paul quoting from the book, one Lord. So he's telling them here, amen, in verse 4, that there is none other God but one. One. Okay, now we know the Jews, they knew not to eat the unclean. Ain't no doubt about it. They had no doubt whatsoever about that. Gentiles, on the other hand, had a different perspective. But then they too were told what to do. Okay, now we're going to see here where uh, eating those things that were sacrificed unto the idols, those things were both unclean and unclean. At this time, for them to make a sacrifice, they used both clean animals and those were considered unclean. Okay, so the question here is, well, if it's clean and I can eat it, if it was offered to the idol, should I or shouldn't I eat it? 
And see, we're dealing with the conscience now. This is what Paul going into now to show what love comes in at. Okay? So then there were two schools of teaching of thought that are involved here. Okay, you had the uh, Karatites, Judaism, okay? Uh, they were the original faith of the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament. And the word Karatism derived from the word Karim, meaning followers of Scripture. And traditionally, tradition, traditionists caused controversy in the early church. You always got people who just... Pure tradition, no. So they caused con controversy in the early church. But the Kerasites held to the letter of the Jewish law, teaching that it was unlawful to receive any benefits from heathen worship or from anything that had been offered to an idol. Okay? It was unlawful to sell or by an idol or meats that were offered to idols. Now we know a cow was good to eat, but if they offer a cow as a sacrifice to an idol, okay, you couldn't you couldn't buy that or eat that cow. Based on what he's referring to here, okay? The tradition maintained that they could use such meat provided that the sign of the idol was not stamped on the meat. Okay, if there's no stamp on it, then it must be good to go. I don't know whether it was offered to an idol or not. See how careful people were then? So a sign could be placed upon the animal before it was sacrificed to the idol. So just on the horns, hoods, and those kinds of things. So when it was killed and sold in the shop, because you know idols don't eat, right? right. Y'all know that? Imaginary. <laughs> 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 uh, I, I, they don't eat. Yeah. So if I'm a heathen and I offer a calf or a cow as a sacrifice to an idol, and when I'm done with that ceremony, then there's meat that has to be eaten that can be sold in the marketplace. Okay? You follow me? Yes, sir. That's like. I we had this conversation before, uh, you and I, but, um, for example, the idols that are at Chinese restaurants. You know, when you go into all you can eat Chinese buffets and they have the idols sitting on top of the, uh, the counter. Mm -hmm. we're, we're still going to eat, mm -hmm. but we don't, we, won't, we don't worship that. Yeah. So I was asking you about that. You was like, well, you, we can still go eat you know, the buffet, but you're not participating in Because when you go in, they give, they put the money, like the Buddha. Yeah. They're sitting up there, and that's an idol. Mm -hmm. that's, that's an idol. Yeah, so it's not a sin for me to patronize the Chinese buffet because what they do is their thing with their idol, which is wrong. Yeah. But, um. Well, I'm pretty sure they have, they didn't sacrifice that food to them. Right, right. It's just that they're, they're idol worship symbol, but they got an established business yeah. and they're just cooking food. Now, if you went in there and said, I'm, I'm going in here to eat, uh, Pastor, you want to come along? And I come up in there mm -hmm. and then I see Buddha sitting there right. and you know it's all right for you to go in there and eat and I start beating up on your conscience. Right. You shouldn't be in here. No, <laughs> that's wrong with what happened. See, I'm, I'm starting to mess you up. Right. Or if you try and pull me in there, force me in there, coerce me in there, then you're beating up on my conscience. Okay. You see? Right. So you got a different level of knowledge than what I have. My conscience is probably weak and yours strong. Right. Okay? Praise the Lord. But that's, that's a good point you bring up there. So again, as I was saying, when it was killed and sold in the shop, mm -hmm. search mark could not be seen. So the Karatite had scruples. They had scruples about all meat, not knowing what had been sacrificed to idols or killed simply for common use. Like you a farmer, you got all these animals, you kill them and take them to the market, right? Right. 
no idol worship involved whatsoever. But the traditional uh, Hebrew followers of the scripture, they didn't know what was what, you see. So those who had knowledge that idols and meats offered to them meant nothing, then they had no scruples against buying and using such meat. Now, we need to be clear that the Jews weren't going to go to the market and buy the hog. Jews had to eat, right? And they ate meat. So if they went to the market, they're going to get that which God had already declared clean for them concerning their diet. Okay, but some wouldn't because they didn't know if it was offered to an idol or not. So their conscience condemned them. So that's some history behind that if we move forward in this because now he says in verse 5, for though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, if there be gods many and large many. Well, what are you saying, Paul? Not only images, but he's talking about the sun, the moon, the planets, the stars, ocean, river, trees, and all other things in creation were used as gods by who? By the heathen. Absolutely. The heathen will use anything for God. Okay? Verse 6 says, but to us, there is but one God. To us. Now, he, he, he's talking to who? The Christians. Yeah, but to us, there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. In other words, Paul is taking the time to denounce idols. He's denouncing idols because idols are absolutely nothing. Okay? So we shift now and talk about the fact that ignorance creates bondage and lack of Christian liberty. In other words, when we're ignorant, we're actually in bondage. And we lose our Christian liberty. <laughs> Same as it is today outside of the church. Just ignorance, period. It creates bondage in our lives. It locks up the end. We can't expand. We can't extend our borders and what have you. And so, therefore, we lose a lot of liberties that we should have. How are we doing? Good. All right, verse 7 says, How be it there is not in every man that knowledge. Well, we have to ask the question, what knowledge? Well, there's a colon right there that's going to explain, right? For some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Okay, Paul let you know we still got some now with conscience of the idol. In, the, in this very hour, eat as a thing offered unto idol. Yeah, it was offered on me, it? So some Jews held to certain rites of the law, and some Gentiles held to certain heathen rites, okay, when they accepted Christianity. Okay, they were heathen, they got saved. So guess what, when you're a heathen and you just get saved, you're still going to continue to do what you were doing until you learn better, because you don't know you got to come into the knowledge, right? right? So all these differences had to be dealt with. They had to be dealt with. you got Jews and Gentiles, the Christian now, with a bunch of differences that they had to be dealt with. And true knowledge gained before perfect harmony between converts could be maintained. His the sound advice in this eighth chapter and us. So then with that, then the Jews knew what they could do and what they could not do.
So let's see where the Gentile fits into all of this. You've heard this before. We've studied it before in the book of Acts. Let's look at Acts chapter 15, verses 19 and 20. Again, they had a big conference at Jerusalem, and they needed to decide what was good and best for the Gentiles coming into the realm of Christianity. And James stood up in the middle of that conference, okay, because they were concerned about what the Gentiles should and should not do. They were teaching that they had to be circumcised. We have learned that they didn't have to be circumcised. And what happened? So he said, wherefore well, my sentence, my judgment is this, that we trouble not them, the Gentiles, which from among the Gentiles are turned to who? God. Turned to God. Those who have turned to God. Verse 20 said, but that we write unto them. The Apostle James said, we write unto them that they abstain from what? Pollutions of idols. Abstain from pollution of idols. Anything that has to do with idols, abstain from it because it's pollution. And from, that means all uncleanliness. All uncleanliness. And from things, what? Strangled and from blood. Because there was a practice, when they killed an animal, they would uh, tie a cord around his neck to choke it out so the blood would swell in the body and get all in the meat. You know how y'all eat them blood sausages? Y'all are mad, y'all, yeah. <laughs> blood sausages, stuff that's loaded with blood, but that's what they would do to animals. You're supposed to bleed an animal out because life is in the blood. So he's telling them they got to avoid things strangled and stay away from eating blood. Okay, that's what they wrote to the Gentile. Now drop down to verse 27, 28 and 29 of that same chapter. Amen. Because we'll see what actually took place here. Acts 15, 27, 20, 29. We have sent therefore Judas and Silas, who shall also tell you the same things by Mouth. In other words, we're sending witnesses down there to tell you the same thing by mouth. We wrote unto you at first. We wrote a letter. Now we're going to send Judas and Silas to you so they can tell you the same thing by mouth. 28. For it seemeth good to who? To the Holy it seemed good to the Holy Ghost. Now, I ain't arguing with the Holy Ghost. And to us, to lay upon you no greater burdens than these necessary things. Well, let's see what is necessary. That you abstain from meats offered to idols. If you know it's been offered to idols, stay away from it. Stay away from it. And from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication, from which, if you keep yourselves, you shall do what? Well. well. Fare you well. Okay? So as Gentiles, we have restrictions upon our diets just like the Jews. Yeah, I mean, it seems good to the Holy Ghost for them to tell us that. But we don't care, though. We Gentiles. <laughs> we ought to eat the hog and the squeal. We, we do it all. Anything unclean, we don't care. Uh, even if you want to, I'm not saying that, you know, it's going to keep you out of heaven, but it sure going to give you a miserable life on this earth with your sickness and your body. That's for sure. You see, I ain't going to beat you down about it. You can sit in front of me if you want to and eat a whole hog. I ain't, ain't, ain't going to bother you. I ain't going to trouble you. Like, like he said. Yeah, because your conscience ain't like mine. I ain't going to you know, love allow me, you know, <laughs> to build you up, not to tear you down. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Because I know the Jews, I know what they ain't going to eat. You ain't going to make them eat it. They ain't going to make them eat it. And they see it being offered up to Ireland, they can't eat it, they ain't going to fool with it. 
You see, even though they know why this or nothing. So what is the conscience? Conscience is simply uh, the conviction of being conscious of a custom. You're, you're conscious. Some had done this all their lives and still regarded sacrifice to idols as real acts of worship. The Gentile sac regarded sacrifices to idols as real acts of worship. Not having true knowledge that idols were nothing. They didn't have that true knowledge that idols are nothing. Okay, so go home and take them off your shelf. Okay? Some had done this all their lives and still regarded sacrifice to idols as real acts of worship, not having true knowledge that idols were nothing. For such to take part in eating meat offered to an idol was to defile the conscience. Okay? Defile their conscience. So he says in verse 8, but meat commended. In other words, the word commended here in the Greek means to place beside or near or to bring into fellowship or give us no advantage if we eat. So, but meat commendeth us not to God. For neither if we eat are we the better. Neither if we eat not are we the worst. You see, or come short if we do not eat. We're not going to come short if we do not eat because meat again does not commend it, but meat commended us not to God, whether we eat or whether we don't eat. What we're supposed to eat, if it was idol, offered up to idols or not. Okay? A lot of people got a lot of thinking, a lot of different thinking about them. Praise the Lord. So now he's going to switch to the fact that the wrong use of Christian liberty and its results. Wrong use of Christian liberty and its results. Its result, okay? So he said in verse 9, and of course we'll see when we get over to chapter 10, verse 23. Verse 9 said, but take heed, take heed least by any means this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block to those who are weak. So what I know I can do as a Christian, I'm going to not do it if it bothers your conscience. Because I don't want it to be a stumbling block. Okay? I don't want it to be a stumbling block. Okay? Stumbling block. So take heed that you do not. Take heed that you do not attend such feasts to idols. Even though you are convinced that an idol is nothing. Okay? This liberty may cause another to stumble who will believe that idols are something and that they are very real. It will cause them to stumble. So he does not have your knowledge, so he will commit sin if he follows your example. If he follows your example, he's going to be because he's messing up his conscience. You know, he see you doing it, you may be at liberty to do it. And only if it's right. But he may still believe that doing that is idol worship. And he follows you, then you mess up this fellow. Because his conscience is still weak. You follow me? Yep. Yeah. Verse, verse 10 says, For if any man see thee which has knowledge of God and the subject, sit and meet in the idol's temple, Shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened? Emboldened meaning to build up or be encouraged, as we saw in verse 1. Such an example would build up the weak brother to follow the practice of the strong, whereas the act of liberty would cause his edifice 
to come tumbling down and he would perish. So shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols. And we gave a good example there when Brother Russell was mentioning earlier that we talked about. Else through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish or to destroy or be lost for whom Christ died. But when you sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you do what? You sin against Christ. It works both ways. So by causing a brother to be lost, you sin against Christ and you defeat the purpose of his sacrificial death. And this is why we should not become a stumbling block to our brother. Love builds up, but knowledge will tear down. It'll tear down because it's puffed up. How we doing? We're good. All right, we'll close here. Review what we next week what we covered this week and pick up with verse 13. Any other question or comments before we get started? I had, uh, before I, we end. I had a question. If if you could go back to um Acts 15 29. Real quick. Oh, actually, yeah. Brother Mark, Brother Mark. I had a quick check, uh, question about uh, the fornication part. That, that's all uncleanliness. Okay. Strangle from, hand from fornication, all uncleanliness. From the animal. In general. Yeah, from the animal, from idol worship, all of that stuff. Okay. Because I was like. Fornication covers all uncleanliness. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No excuse. Yeah. That's why he tell them they got to abstain from that. But he starts off talking about food, from blood and from things strangled and from fornication, all uncleanliness, all idol worship, and what have you. He, he, Paul's not talking about the uh, not, uh, the fornication with animals. Oh no, no, no. Okay, okay. No. that's what I was. But like. that is part of fornication because it's uncleanliness. Because right. that's a bestiality. We, we call that pe bestiality. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So it. fornication is all uncleanliness. Okay. Mm. Got it. Shacking. <laughs> yeah. 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 All of that's uncleanliness. Yep. Yeah. Sex before marriage. All of that is uncleanliness. You see. And the Gentile were doing things by the book that even the Jews wasn't doing. Yes, Sister Sherry. But if you, okay, say like. Let us stand. You, you, you're in the world, but you're doing fornication, but you're not knowing it. It don't hang over your head. You do it. I mean, he that knoweth to do right and to do it not to him is a sin. So if you are saved, you're going you gonna to learn about what fornication is. Oh yeah, the soul that sinned is here, surely die. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, because if you're not saved, you're already dead, right? Yeah. I'm going to say stand one more time so we can get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Father, Lord God, we love you. We appreciate you. We give you praise. We thank you, Lord God, for this steady and taking open of our minds, our hearts, and our understanding that we may receive your word and receive it with joy and have we See it that we act upon it to do all that you have commanded of us. Bless the food that has been prepared for us, for the strengthening and the nourishing of our body, that we may do your bidding. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you.